everybody. Welcome back to the Straight Out of BS podcast. Um, thank you again for the support. Um, please keep on sharing the videos. Um, if you know anybody that's new to the series or whatever, just turn them on to it and just, let's just get the word out there more and more. I'm noticing that uh, I actually posted it in a group about a extreme haunted house the other day. And now I have a bunch of people from there coming over here and being like, hey, well, I want to talk to you and stuff like that. And one of those people actually like I'm not sure exactly what she does, but she says that she used to like work in that industry. And so I was like, I really want to interview you. Like, I'd really like to pick your brain about that kind of stuff. So she's like, I'm hella down. So anyways, just the words getting out there. So keep on sharing. It does matter. The likes and sharing and all that stuff does really matter with the algorithm. So thank you guys for all of that. Thank you guys for my Patreon. Thank you all of you from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate that more than you know. And uh, yeah, pretty much uh, I want to do a moment of silence for the people still struggling with like addiction or anything like that. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay, thank you for that. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce yourself and where you went and what years. Um, I'm Zoe Schreiber. I went to um, a few programs. I started out with Second Nature Utah in 2004, 20 years this year, Um, then went to Mission Mountain School in Condon, Montana, Um, and from there they decided I needed um, more more support and more intensity, so I ended up at uh, Cedar Ridge Academy in, uh, in Utah. Um, Roosevelt, Utah. So kind of bounced uh, bounced to a few different programs over the course of almost four years. Okay. And uh, can you walk us through like what was going on like before? What led up to like you going there? Do you know exactly why you got sent there? Uh, what led up to it? Yeah. So the year before um, I had got sent in a way. So I was 13, uh, had my 14th birthday in wilderness. Um the year before my parents had separated um, and divorced. And so there was a lot of turmoil within the house. Um, I had always been a kid that was very, very full of expression, very quick to um, have emotions, emote, outbursts, like from from a young age. Um, And I think it got to the point where my family especially my dad felt like there was nothing he could do, um, especially within creating a new um, kind of family and life for himself. And so out of desperation, um, I I do genuinely think my parents were at a point of complete desperation. They were introduced to an educational consultant um, who was huge in bringing them into basically making them buy on to the concept of of sending your kid away of how much it would benefit um and that's really where they fell into and found the solution was you know sending her away she'd be out of the chaos of home as they thought um she'd be safe nothing would be able to hurt her and she'd be having therapy and things to learn so that was a lot of their mindset um and there was just a lot of chaos i had been was about to be expelled from my middle school like there were just a lot of things that had they not intervened home life would have been more difficult um and i do think that there was a lot of chaos there and something needed to be done in my life um i just think they found the recommendations from the wrong place in the form of an educational consultant. Okay. Uh, were, did, did, you, did they have you like medicated uh, as a kid? Like, uh, cause it sounds to me like, were you, uh, correct me, like, were you autistic? Are you on the autistic spectrum? Is that like what this sort of stuff was like? Cause yeah. I was the same way. So, yeah. So, were, so yeah, I was, my, my parents started me in therapy and medication when I was about eight years old. So it was not a stranger to that. Um, treated me heavily for bipolar, uh, for when I was younger, they treated me for depression and some inattentive stuff. Um, I'd always been a kid very based in like justice and why, um, and trying to have these things like further explained to me. Um, 
And then when I went to program, they diagnosed me with basically bipolar. Um, just before you're 18, it's a different diagnosis and started me on other meds. Um, and so, yeah, this, I was always very, my, my parents, therapy, meds, all of that stuff wasn't new. Um, I also have an uncle who's severely autistic. Um, like he, he lives with someone he's high, high, very high needs. And so that very much in my family was, that's what being autistic is. There is no spectrum. There is no other things are being there. And as a woman, as the oldest daughter, there's a lot of masking I learned, especially being a very like justice oriented person. Um, but yeah, that's as I've gotten older and my sister and I have, have, you know, looked into it. And then also just talking with, um, with some of my healthcare providers is, yeah, this is a very strong misdiagnosis and mistreatment um, of something just because we didn't quite know or attribute a lot of that to girls, especially. So yeah, it was definitely like ther therapized and all of that stuff before. So that was in their mind was where they, where they thought they could get help from. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was yeah. just wondering if it was like undiagnosed or, or if it was possibly under undiagnosed or something like that, but yeah, un it was basically <clears throat> diagnosed autism at that point. And I, and I, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Okay. Uh, were you transported or what, what happened there? Did you? No, I wasn't. Um, I am very fortunate that the dynamics between my parents, um, my father had a lot of control um, because he was wealthy. We were private, private funded, uh, all private funded placement. My mother was more kind of at the mercy. She was, they were going through a divorce. But one thing my mom refused on was having me be transported. That was, my mom was like, absolutely not. Um, and basically the deal was she would transport me herself and would be ready to call the cops whenever. Um, and I trust, like, my mom, like, literally was like, she's like, please, like, stay with me. Like, stay calm. Like, let's do this this way. Let's do it in a way that you feel safe. Um, I don't know what the fuck was ahead of me. But at yeah. least I didn't have that experience. And to this day, I very much appreciate and thank my mom and... Anytime my mom hears stories, it just, it brings her to tears because she just, that, that was the one thing that she just could not, could not stand for. So, so, so had you guys had like, um, like any conversations about like where you were going prior? Because like, the only reason I ask is because you, you, you were talking about how like she was trying to make it as comfortable as she could for you. So, yeah. So I knew I was going to be placed, um, at that point, we were looking at different um, different options, including some more community based, um, not therapeutic, but more just like boarding school with support, wraparound support um, about an hour away from me. And that was what I had thought I, we were getting into. And that me going to Utah was just a little break, reorienting, like having some time was very much sold to me as that um the educational consultant ended up calling me like while we were on our way it was very very weird um but yeah I was told and I was told it was going to be you know it'll be gone for six weeks it was closer to 12 um and then I was basically told it'd be you know maybe six months um and that I'd be coming home and doing more closer to home so at that point, for me, that seemed fine, right? I yeah. didn't want to be around my stepmother and my father at that point. So there was a willingness to get out and leave and, and be okay with that. And I think that's um, something that I, that I, I think a lot of that was my mom for that. Okay. okay. 
Um, so do you do you know or do you remember uh, like roughly maybe how much your parents paid for like the first, were paying for the first place? Because you said your private placement. Do you remember how much they were charging? So um, wilderness, I can't remember how much wilderness was, but um, my final placement, Cedar Ridge, was eight grand a month. I want to say, um, and. Really expensive. Really expensive. I mean, like my dad like tries to be like, oh, we spent this and this. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, but yes, very expensive. Um, and yeah, like I would say my treatments all treatment altogether, placements altogether were over a quarter million dollars. Okay. So, so the, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I just like that was um I also had grandparents who contributed. Like it very much was the feeling of we don't have any other options. So this is going to make everything better. Okay. So the first place you went, was it a wilderness place? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. So Second okay. Nature um, was in uh, Duchesne um, in, in Utah. Um, very, very cold, high, high desert. Um and just as uh, you know, Mel, but as Mel says, people don't even keep their horses out there during the winter, and yet the kids are sent out to wilderness there. So, uh, yeah. Okay. That was, yeah, it was about 12 weeks. Okay. Do you, do you remember, like, on average, like, uh, how many people were there when you got there, and how many people were there when you left? My was, like, group... Yeah, so I was, it was only our group, our one group. I would say that it was about 12 of us. Okay. Um, I think it would flex. I think at one point we had, there were like 15 of us, but it would flex anywhere between like 10 to 15, floating around 12. Um, and we'd have anywhere from two to three staff with us that would rotate through. Um, okay, was it, was it um, co-ed or was it just no. girls or? Um, my group was just girls. So... Okay. Um, Second Nature was a co-ed program, but separated. Um, okay, so they just had the two two genders separated, okay. Yeah, and multiple groups. Like, they dropped, I mean, they're one of the bigger, I think they're the biggest one in Utah, and they had a, have a Georgia facility or had a Georgia facility and just would crank out kids. Um, yeah. So smaller groups of kids, but they would consistently crank out yes. new kids okay yes okay. there was rare it never dipped low there was always consistent kids coming in okay okay um what was the worst part about that place like the wilderness part for you or the hardest part yeah i think i think there was There was this hope that if I did well at Wilderness, I would have been able to come right home. So there was a part of me that was still very much um, trying to, to move forward, trying to prove I could come back home, trying to prove I could just come back to my mom's. Um, and at one point, my educational consultant came um, out there to meet with us. And it was at that point, it really like dawned on me, like, this isn't the last stop. Um, and very much, she started talking about the ongoing relationship and making sure like where I go next is fine. Um, and, and I think at that point it was very, I felt like abandoned in the wilderness. Like, here you go. We've just plopped you out in the middle of nowhere while we figure out what goes next. And what I found out why I was there for so long was the program that I, my parents initially wanted me to go to required more like medical testing and all sorts of stuff. So literally because they were looking for somewhere, my stay was extended. So. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. They, I wonder what kind of medical stuff they were. So, um, I, they made me do um, a gynecological exam before um, I was able to be admitted, and it was horrible. 
um, small town doctors are have no sympathy and um, being brought in with staff like that. Um, you know, there was excitement like, yeah, I got to shower. But um, no, yeah. it was it was it was that they they wanted to, you know, I had had sex, so it had to make sure I was not wrong or dirty or anything like that. Yeah, they had to do the whole invasive thing. Very much. Uh, so. <clears throat> okay, so you went to that first place. Uh, how was the food in in wilderness? Do you, I I imagine because I went on wilderness too. So did they ration you up at certain certain points? Is that how they did this? Yeah. So we would have drops, right? So each day we would normally it'd be a hiking day. There'd rarely we'd have a down day, maybe like one a week. Um, and when we'd get low on stuff, we they we'd go to their our next drop. So they just go throughout the area making drops, telling people where they were, and then be your water, your food, everything. I mean, food is like dehydrated rice and beans and oats and granola. And I can't even remember anything about that. It's BNR and oats and granny. Like yeah, all yeah. I can remember. Um and our water and what would happen. And, and one thing I distinctly remember is no matter what, we would have to make it to that point. And there was one time where we were going so late, someone had had, um, someone was having a really hard time, like reasonably so. Um, and our next drop point was pretty far away and on a really dangerous hike. And we were, you know, with our huge packs on, scaling up against the wall, like face up against a rock cliff with nothing behind us. Pitch black in the middle of the night because we needed to get our next set of water and rations. So um, it very much was that. And if we hadn't um, busted our own fire, created our own fire, we wouldn't have hot food. And I can tell you, rehydrated um, beans and rice with cold water is probably one of the grossest things um, you can have. Yeah, definitely, definitely, especially repetitively. <laughs> you start, you get really motivated to to bust a fire. That's I started getting really good at that after a while. Did, did you guys have to have like uh, the one I was at? Uh, we had to have, so every day we would have to have a new person lead the group, and then if the person didn't know how to like, if they got, if they got lost, like I I didn't know how to read a compass, so I was just like, oh, I was completely like, and everybody was getting mad at me. They were getting hella pissed at me. Because, like, if you you either know how to do it or you don't. And if you don't yeah. know how to do it, then you, you you should have learned how to do it or somebody should teach you. Teach but you. I was never the popular person, so never, nobody wanted to help me with anything. So it no. was just. Yeah, it was always staff-led. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, we never, we never were in charge of getting ourselves around. I mean, everything looks the same. I don't know if anybody could, like. I, for them, they were like, it's a leadership thing because they're trying to make you learn like leadership qualities and like learn how to lead a group and stuff. And it's like, I don't need this. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is and not. I obviously don't know how to do it. it like, looks, yeah. It's like, can I switch out? It's like, no, this is your duty. <laughs> it's like, I think I can be productive on other aspects of this. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. Now. Please. Yeah. Um. So, how long were you? You said 12 weeks you were there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then. Did you know that you were going to? Oh, yeah, you said briefly that yeah. you knew you were yeah. going to the other place, but you didn't know exactly where you were going yet. I found out right before. Basically, my mom came and picked me up. They did, like, your parents came out for the weekend. They stayed with you. Um, for, for, like, the graduation? Was graduated. that, like, graduation? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my mom's like, okay. oh, my gosh, I wish we never did that because then I saw how horrible it was for you and your hands were, like, brown, like, soup. Like, I couldn't get, like, my hands were dirt-stained for ages. Um, but she picked me up. We had a night in Montana, and then we went to um, – uh, in Utah. And then we went to Condon, Montana, to Mission Mountain School, um, which is an all-girls facility – uh, I believe floated around 40 kids, 40 to 50. Um, I, and so, and, and, uh, yeah, in the middle of nowhere out by Glacier, um, National Park and was equine based, um, that, so, you know, there were the horses there that you would get all the therapy with, 
Um, so that was the next stop for me. Okay. What, what did you think about the equine therapy? Because I've heard that it can work really well, but I, I imagine in that kind of setting, I don't think, right? It, it wasn't right. It was used as, so for myself, like I got in a lot of trouble. And so my punishment would be scooping frozen horse crap out of the fields. So this concept that we were having like equine therapy was a nuance and miss, right? It was basically the horses were there. If you were at a certain level or there was one girl there at one point who like had raced horses. So, or like had shown horses or parents were like very adamant. She got a lot on it. She was a wonderful person, but it was weird. Um, but it was more like they had horses and we took care of them. Um, and that there was supposed to be therapy in cleaning up crap and mending fences and bucking hay and all that stuff. And then when we had family visits, we'd have the equine therapy session and the parents would get to see how amazing and wonderful that program was. And it was like, I haven't been around these horses other than their crap for months. So um, it was... It was, a, I mean, in a lot of ways, a gimmick. I think equine therapy done well and in the right settings. I think any kind of comfort, any kind of animal, any kind of behavior you can interact with can be really good. It just comes down to how you bastardize the setting. And in that case, it was. Mm -hmm. It's really unfortunate, too. Because <clears throat> horses aren't bad innately, you know? No. And it was, you know, when we could actually spend time with them, it was wonderful. Like I wasn't begrudging having to do that work, knowing the horses were in good shape. Yeah. But, you know, that that was what it very much felt like was they're here to teach you a lesson not to give you therapy. OK, I, had, well, I actually had one more question about the first place. Did you experience any like favoritism at the first the wilderness? OK. Very much so. In all three, uh, all three facilities I was at, I was very much the last one, especially um, I was very much like on the lower of the totem pole. Um, very like not a favorite. And then my last place was very much a scapegoat by staff and and other students. OK. And was there any like inappropriate stuff between staff and kids that you heard about or saw? Um, at Wilderness? No. Okay. Um, and at my first program, no. Okay. Um, Cedar Ridge has, uh, Cedar Ridge, there's quite a few Cedar Ridge staff that have, um, uh, there's one that has a criminal, criminal history and then a few others, um, for sexually assaulting kids there. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but not not wilderness or I'm at Mission Mountain. Um, okay, where and then how how long were you at Mission Mountain? Seven months. Seven months. Seven months. So, um, Mission Mountain was set up in um, on the scale of things was much um, less supervised. So each there were each cabins. Um, there were no staff that were actively in the cabins with all the girls. Um, and so there was definitely more um, solo time. And I, rightfully so, um, was barely 14 and was having a lot of problems and was not making friends and was becoming, being alone in those settings without staff became a danger for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so my educational consultant, my family were like, this isn't right. We tried for the less restrictive, but for her safety, we're now going to go into a more restrictive atmosphere. And so that's why I wasn't there for the extended time. Um, they thought that it was not literally not restrictive enough um, for me. Okay. And then that, that is that why you went to the third place? Correct. And so Cedar Ridge, I was at for um, from, I want to say, October of 2004 through when I left in 2000. Seven? Okay. 
something like that. I'm blanking on the numbers. Um, but yeah, so then I was at in Utah for the rem that remaining time. Okay. And uh, I keep on forgetting questions about these prior ones, but did anybody run from any of these places that you know of or heard about? Yes. So all of them. Um, I don't really remember the story with Mission Mountain, um, but the ones foretold with wilderness were very much told as a means to scare us. They didn't hide the fact that people had run. Um, they would very much tell us that this is how it was handled and that they'd never have anybody like actually get away. Um, and Cedar Ridge had some very interesting history with with runaways and some successful ones. Um, there was a death that occurred for someone who was off site runaway, arguably. Um, she was trying to get away from the program and she died in a car accident. So, um, yeah, lot, lots of them. There was a, a trio of guys that successfully um, made it out and into town and I'm dear friends with two of them still and still to this point it's like memorable and we like talk about it all the time like I'll see him out and about and I'll just be like Lubin I love you I'm so glad you made it out and he was like yeah all the uh cactus thorns in my feet um but yeah we definitely there were definitely runaways from every program okay um and then so <clears throat> The second program, you're going to the third. Did you get transported? No. My mom went, my mom came and picked me up again. Okay. Um, and that one was the very much like, I like, you don't, don't screw this up, Zoe. Like, this is literally, you screw this up and like, it's even worse. Um, because I was really upset. I was, I could kind of see what was going on. Um, and... I learned later my educational consultant, I believe, had had like a backup plan in case things went sideways. Okay, so you so you got you went from the second to the third program because essentially because uh, you for for your safety because you were so whatever it was going on, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so you go to the third program. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, are these points and levels programs? Um, yes. Are they? Are, is that how this works? Are there yep. merits and demerits? Like you yep. lose points? Okay. Point. Okay. So in in because I was at Cedar Ridge the longest and had um you know was the most recent and had some of the most impactful moments on me. I there that's really the core of the program that I really remember and have. The other ones are a little more patchy and not quite as um, present you know, in, for me. Um, but yeah, we had had points we would, uh, we had our level program, we had consequence points we would have to earn back. Um, and yeah, those two would influence each other. Um, and I was always, always a low level um, kid. Very, very much struggled to get through the levels. Um, very much was someone that I, that I get to that next level. I sabotage do something and they they demote me um and so yeah it was a very very it didn't work well with my brain <coughs> okay what do you think the hardest part about being there was for you and how did you handle it so my third night there i was restrained and it was at that point restrained face down in a mud puddle while it was raining for three hours because I didn't eat a pack of butter. Um, and it was at that point that I realized, hey, close this, I'm sorry for the dog. Um, mm -hmm. It was at that point I really realized that I'm stuck, I'm hopeless, and I can't do anything about this. Um, and I went into complete, just, I checked out. I didn't do anything. I didn't want to engage. Um, I got put on watch level in an orange jumpsuit, no shoes. Um, we would do, like, if you hit a bunch of, like, points, consequence points, you'd have to go out to compost. Um, 
and just shovel compost for all day. So very quickly there, I I got the memo. I got what safer for me meant. It meant more oppressive, more control, less choice. I went from a program that we were kids in each of these cabins, didn't have adults, to each of these homes were very much monitored, two night staff at night. I ended up um, on my watch level sleeping on the floor next to night staff. So very much a, a jump um, in in secure security and being uh, just on top of things. And so it was very much it was very apparent there and I the staff um, that were part of my restraint um, one of them two of them actually just became like the bane of my existence and like really um, purposely went out of their way to make my life hard um, and would just basically like pick on me in family time which was our group setting our group um, basic our group therapy every night and that really I, I think that was a time in my life um and when I reflect back it was like the most hopeless like I just did not that was probably the hardest point is just I was done yeah okay <clears throat> was there an intervention or like a solitary confinement at these places yeah so we had compost um, so we had we had two things. We had watch level, um, which was basically like if you came when you first came in, you were on a watch level. Staff kept you closer. Um, you'd be you'd sleep in a bedroom closer, all the way to watch level four, where you were in an orange jumpsuit, no shoes, um, you know, sandals, um, sleeping on the floor without a pillow next to night staff with lights on. Right. So so there was a variety of that, and then. Um, watch level four was if you were like a runaway risk or if you were out on compost. Um, and so then our kind of, when I was there, the main thing they used for like solitary was taking us out to compost, um, where we would just shovel compost from one pile to another 50 scoops at a time. Um, and just excessively asking for, um, staff feedback being fed just horrible food uh so that was how they handled um like solitude time away from the group punishment time okay and did they have like um w with that was it like you couldn't talk to anybody you couldn't was there like it couldn't look at because the place i went uh, at spring creek they had something called black cloud and it was like you couldn't look at anybody you couldn't acknowledge them you couldn't talk to them you could, if they talked to you and you you responded or like acknowledged that they even talked to you then you're in trouble yeah right? yeah and that's there was like on watch level there were different aspects of that but when you were on compost they would literally get you out of the house um and and shoveling before all the kids other kids woke up you wouldn't come in for lunch like you were completely isolated um from the rest of the group like from point a to point b and then different watch levels and different levels um would have that into it wrapped into it but they they really isolated the kids um and if you were caught smiling at someone on watch level or waving at them you would you would get in trouble yourself okay and uh yeah. was it co-ed so, yeah, so Cedar Ridge was, um, but there was no co-ed interactions till uh, level 700. Okay. We actually did, like, the school was a bit more um, because it was based on, like, where we were at educationally. They couldn't keep us split so much, um, you know, boys and girls. Um, and then we did karate was the sport we did and then we did it all together so there were opportunities that we were like in close proximity but it wasn't like we were engaging with the boys at all was there any like weird grooming stuff on the part of like the staff towards the kids because there was a lot of that stuff that went on at the place I was at yeah yeah 
um, and a lot of favoritism. Um, mm. And there was, like like it said, there had been a, one of the staff had been criminally charged with, um, with raping students. Um, and they, like, he went to jail. Like, this was right after I left and had a lot of feelings about it because he was one of my favorite staff. And, um, yeah, just very weird when you feel, like, betrayed like that. Um, so I, I was not his targeted, um, kind of demographic, but, um, once that came out, that was very weird. Um, I did hypnosis with the owner, um, and in those sessions, those were a little grabby, and then we'd have tractor rides sitting on, only the girls would randomly go sit on the owner's lap, so very, like, weird stuff like that that was treated as like oh you're getting hypno with rob like that's amazing or oh you get to go into a tractor ride with rob um and then from the other side he had a son who was there who was just crazy and so he would not so much grooming but would literally like beat on us in karate um would use us as like Dude, you're a black belt. You shouldn't be punching on these, like, 14-year-old kids who don't know karate at all. Um, so very much a using children for for whatever was there and whatever they needed. Do you think that they got off on it? Yeah, 100%. Okay. 100%. And uh, do, is this place still open? So, no. Um Fortunately, they ended up selling to um, another company and um, called Makana Leadership Academy. And a group of us were like, oh, hell no, you are not different. You're doing the exact same thing. So the, what they all do. Yep. They all do. So um, a group of us went full fledged attack, media attack on them. We went after things. We we found out. We found all these like gross like business proposals that these head guys had cooked up and how they were gonna make money and tap into public payer. Like it was a very disgusting thing. And as they were trying to say we're separate from it, we kept finding these things. And eventually, um, it was effective to the point where. Students were being pulled. They couldn't um, keep students. And also staff were starting to leave um, because they were hearing about what was actually happening. So um, out of that, they closed um, and have not reopened, will not reopen. It's, it's, not a, it's not an enterprise asset anymore. Do we know what the, what the owners are doing or like what, what they did after he, um, from what I understand, is he owns, he has multiple, like, a lot of real estate. So I think he's made money off of his real estate. And um, he just lives on site there still. Um, Interesting. Built a house that the kids helped build, you know. And so he's just stayed there. Um, we had heard some things about him engaging in some like elder abuse with um like later on with with some um I don't know if it was his partner or someone he was living with um but as as we were working on stuff getting shut down we were just finding out a lot and very telling of the kind of person um he was to kind of start a program like this and keep it going yeah, it's like he, he started abusing kids and then now he's abusing elderly people who probably have no, like, they probably can't defend themselves either. Yeah. Cause a lot of elderly people can't. No. Um, and, uh, okay, then let's see. How is the food at there? How is the food? I always have to ask how the food was. No, I love that. Food was horrible. Um, I have, <clears throat> and which is funny because my favorite, um, like job I had to go do was work in the kitchen. So it was this weird, like I liked being in there. The kitchen staff were great. The food and what they had to give us and like having to buy everything from Cisco and canned and frozen, it was absolutely disgusting. 
they did their best, right? I swear yeah. to God, those cafeteria ladies were a godsend. Kim was like amazing. I love her. And they were stuck with crap to deal with. Um, so I personally still have aversions to some food that I will never get over. Um, like, yeah, that just is not is not there. And really not much good stuff came out of it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, working kitchen was awesome, though. Right? I always loved working kitchen. And then and they can eat as much of the food as you wanted, too. Like, you know. You're like, okay, I'm going to take a little bit of this. I don't have to take yeah. any more of the rest. Not going to get in trouble. Yeah, yeah. I like, I really like doing dishes because so autistic of me because I liked being quiet and alone and the sensation of the water like total yeah. like like I was in heaven on that and I learned to bust it out so like there was if I wanted dishes I would be on dishes and it totally yeah. just was a meditative like moment alone because you'd never get that yeah yeah and you're just focusing on a repetitive task you know mm -hmm. yep it's really good yep. okay um, what was like, uh, like some, you talked about the kitchen, like what was some other ways like you just would, uh, just like escape, like where you were like in your head, like so, were you able to read books or anything like that? No, no. So book books were a privilege. Mu music was a privilege. Um, there was, they had animal care and, um, before, so at Cedar Ridge, they had llamas, alpacas, they had a bull, bunch of different birds, goats. Uh, there was a pig at one point that we ate later. Um, but because there was birds, I very much, um, I was into birds as a kid and still am. I have um, 13 parrots and 10 chickens outside. I worked awesome. at a bird store. Like that was like my soul. And so one thing that they they recognized that and they were like, oh, someone can like, we'll dedicate this kid to the birds like she will do it. So I ended up one year um, raising 50 turkeys and 100 chicks um, just helping like and so that was that was my reward. Like they let me do more work and spend time with the birds Um and that was really cool because I also was finishing school tasks so quickly um, that they had to slow me down. Um, I graduated high school a year early just because I was churning through things. So basically their their give off was, well, you can go hang out with the birds and raise them and do that. So that was a really, that was really cool. Um, and there was one staff, Catherine, who would always I I reflecting back on it now she would always volunteer to take me and she was one of the kindest people the most kindest wonderful people and I think she left right before I left because I think it became untenable for her but it was she helped with some silence with some safety with really letting me have that moment without having to do check backs all the time. Like she just let me be there with the birds. Um, so that was very, very special um, to, to have a staff that really saw that and, and brought that out for me. That's cool. I'm glad that you had that. Did uh, just the one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Did the credits transfer? Um, so I hadn't gone. Um, I basically, left middle school, left midway through eighth grade and <laughs> went through and finished all of high school um, and applied for colleges while I was there. Um, and yeah, all of, I was accepted into, um, I was accepted into Mills, I was accepted into Berkeley, Davis, Santa Cruz. So I was like accepted into some good schools. Um, I chose to go to a local all women's college um, in Oakland that my mom had went to. And um, it translated really well, but I was very fortunate that my diploma was recognized um, for as as a true high school diploma because they had gone they had gone through a program, right? So like we were doing the workbooks from the program they contacted out with, with all that kind of stuff. So that's how they accredited it. Okay. 
Um, did they get when you first got there? Did they give you like a rule manual or like uh, just like this is what you're supposed to do? This is like the rule. Like, did they go over any of that with you? Did they buddy you up with somebody to like show you the ropes? Did they do any of that? So they I they gave us like some manuals. They gave us some stuff. I, from my perspective, um, like it was day two or day three, I got restrained. And I think it was very telling of a miscommunication of expectations um, and really not showing, right? Like, you have to eat all your food. Fine. My butter, my little extra butter pad is considered food, right? Clarify, you have to eat everything you take. Um, so I think that while they tried doing it, um, it didn't wasn't effective. And then, no, they didn't. They didn't buddy us up, and by the time, like, I had gone on isolation watch level four, um, it was kind of like, here's rough learning. We're not, you don't get to learn from the handbook anymore. Okay. And did they have, like, these self-help improvement, self-improvement seminars that, that the place I did? Okay, so did they have the same ones that, that we had? Did they have orientation discovery focus? No, they weren't as, um, Spring Creek's Wasp, right? Yeah. So, so, um, we, Rob came out of Cross Creek and so, which is like earlier Wasp. And so yeah. they, um, very similar, but not the same names. Um, but, okay. but very much those same concepts, that same structure, um, of, you know, it was the owner or another one of the talking heads coming and doing a set. They, we called them seminars. Um, and yeah. Okay. Did they, did they have you make an I am statement? Like I am, I'm an empathetic, loving, handsome, and powerful man. So or we, stuff like that. Yeah. So we had, um, we had like trigger sheets we'd fill out every day. And at the end of them, we had a, like a statement that was basically like that. So like, you'd have to reflect on the whole process and then define like a statement for yourself. And that's what you would go through during group. So yeah, that very much like bringing it back and trying to, I think it was a very identifying are basically creating our tying our identities to our behavior in a means to break us down. Do you feel like any of that, the, the, the seminars that you went through or any of the programs or any of that, do you feel like any of it was beneficial to you? Did you get any positive things out of the program at all? I think that I walked away with an awareness, um, of, with a self-awareness to a fault. Um, I think that it, so like in, in coming out, I was in a lot of ways, more aware of my behaviors, more aware of some of the things I was doing than my peers. Um, I could make different, different decisions. Um, and that was from the forced introspection, from the forced examining of things. And while I think a lot of it was maladaptive, um, and what was actually learned was like <clears throat> overburdening myself. I think as I've reoriented it, um, that self-awareness and that being able to look in myself was something I did take away. Um, because that was, as I say to my therapist, like self-awareness and engaging in that was a means of survival um, for us. Okay. What have you struggled with the most because of the program or since the program, since you got out? Like what's hard, harder for you? You know, it's with? really interesting because I feel like it flows. So I'm this year um, in January is uh, 20 years from first getting sent away. And as I've, as I've come away from it, I think the more time goes on, I realize the biggest thing that I lost and have had to mourn was reintegration, um, just reintegration in general and being able to support myself through um, just through life, life changes um, and everything that came because I was um, 17 when I left 
and went right into college. And so there is a lot of of just reliance on others um, that carried over originally very tangible things. And as I got older, it very much was self-centering is very hard for me and is one of the biggest things that I like work on within my my therapy now is just how to how to go inward without feeling so oppressed by my own internal thoughts my own internal feelings um and just being comfortable in that space because for a long time it wasn't safe to do so um surviving meant not tapping into that so I think that's been as of late um and kind of at the core one of the bigger things um that has been following me Okay. And so did you graduate from there? Did you get pulled eventually? Did your parents come and get you? So I, um, I actually had to have emergency surgery, um, there. I had a large ovarian cyst, the size of a lemon hanging off my ovary, um, and had been sick, had had the flu, um, for days. And it wasn't until, um, I went to the bathroom, vomited and passed out. That night shift was like, I'm bringing you in. We're not like the untrained night staff saved me. Um, so that happened. And then two months later, I was they were going to graduate me in August and then move me directly into the dorm rooms, which I think was the stupidest thing ever. But it was so they could milk a few more months out of my dad. Mm-hmm. Um Two months later, I had another cyst that they were like, we're going to have to remove. And my mom was like, nope, no more surgeries in Utah. You are coming home. She's done. She, yeah. I, I'd been finished with all my high school stuff. They literally were just keeping me there. So um, I don't think I quite graduated the program. Um, I think I was a little shy of it, but they didn't. They let me have a graduation ceremony and everything. Okay, did they set you up with a live contract? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. I was very curious about that. How long did that last? Um, How long was it supposed to last or how long did it actually last? (laughs) Well, I mean, it's supposed to last forever, right? Right. (laughs) Oh, exactly. And there were, I think there were some really, like, concrete things, like, five years out. Like, some very, like, and remember, this is, like, right when... Like, this is right when, like, Facebook and MySpace are, like, really getting established, right? And so they're just little things that I reflect. It was, like, I wouldn't go online. I wouldn't do these things. I wouldn't engage with this. I wouldn't, like, I went and said, like, I wouldn't talk to, like, people I wanted to have, like, sex with. There were just very weird things that I, that I like, reflect back on. I'm, like, that was some serious brainwashing. Yeah. And, like, the fact that, like, My parents, my therapist, like everybody got together and was like, yeah, this is the best thing for a girl who's going off to cop, right? Yeah, (laughs) I don't understand. I've never understood the justification of that. And it went right out the window very, very quickly. Like I didn't even, my dad tried to have, my dad tried to hold on to it longer than anybody else. So. Okay. Um, have you talked to your parents about how it felt being at these places? Uh, and where I'm where I, with my parents is I've forgiven them, but I'm not going to forget what they did, you know, and like what happened. So like, where are you? Uh, with your parents? So I, my mom is amazing. My mom was in, in terms of like all the power dynamics, right? My mom was the one who was, she was the woman who didn't have money, who didn't work, who she, she was very much powerless. Um, and a lot of decisions were made um, without too much of her input. So, um, and with that, they very much like, they said I was codependent with my mom because my mom would like understand and worry about me and voice concerns about the program. Um, So I always had an advocate in my mom um, and it's only once I left and talked to her more about it, did I know quite the extent of it. Um, they did, the programs did a really good job of keeping us isolated and keeping my mom from being able to just like support me. Um, my dad, I will never get, um, a like true, my dad's autistic. I will never, (laughs) I will never get a true, I'm sorry out of him. Um, 
but more and more I get talking things through my, he's an attorney. So we'll talk about, you know, the legal stuff side of it. And, and I know my dad enough that that's him going through it. Right. And, and recognizing like, I made a mistake. I want to help you through it. I know I will never get, and I'm sorry from him. And so for myself, like my relationship with my dad's very different for a variety of reasons, but that's a part of it. Um, but I still talk to them. They're still in my life. Um, my mom more so than my dad. But. Okay. Um, if you could go in a time machine, if you could go back in time in a time machine and not go through these places, would you do it and why? Yes. Um, I definitely think that it brought more more stress and trauma into my life than it really would. I will say, though, that I think had my parents been able to navigate and work out something of more community-based placement for me, being close to home, I think I really would have thrived. Um, I will openly admit that, and my parents will too, um, and my mom takes accountability, home was not a stable place. Home was, I needed more support than what I was getting. And I think it very much calls out and, and it's not lost on me that we still are struggling with this. There are going to be instances and places and homes that kids shouldn't be in or need more support of, but the but the other solution shouldn't just be sending them away. So while I would take it away, I would also, with that, would want to find that what that other support that they had originally been looking at would look like. Because I, 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 I wouldn't have done well through the chaos with my mom, with my dad and my stepmother. Okay. <clears throat> you said you were on hella medications growing up and stuff like that. Um, I know that you smoke marijuana. Um, how much does marijuana help you with the symptoms of your autism? Uh, like for me, I don't, I don't really take any prescription medication. I just smoke weed. So like, how is it with you? Like, how have you found? So I, um, so just medication wise, I, I went off meds for a little bit in college completely and realized for myself, I was like, yeah, been on them for 20 years. Like it's time to figure it out. Realized that was not good for me. I am, um, I personally do well on, you know, give me a little bit of SSRIs. Um, I do well with um, an anti-epileptic for a mood stabilizer. I'm now epileptic, so that's a whole different story. Um, but what cannabis has really helped me for is I was dealing with a lot of night terrors and inability to sleep and stomach problems when I first got out. And my, my mom was a medical patient um, here in California. And so access was created quite quickly as an adult right after I came out because it was there. Um, and with that, I was able to stop taking um, trazodone, which made me feel horrible at night. I was able to really minimize the benzodiazepines I had to take. Um, I went off of a bunch of antispasmatic drugs for my stomach um, and really helped with some of my migraine symptoms. And so it's not lost on me that one of the things I agreed to not do in my home contract was one of the best things that has been for my life to the point where this is my, my career. Like I very much, I, I, I work in cannabis for making sure like regulations are met so that people are safe. Um, and because it's helped me so much, because it's really been a source for me. And I'm also someone who, after time off of psych meds realized I like them too. And the world likes me better with them. So it's that it's a good middle ground that I found for myself. And I feel like it's a journey for everybody. Like had I not gone screw it, you guys were wrong for me. Like, and not experienced that not been like, yeah, I've been on meds since I was eight. I would never be able to say with, with my full like intention that I'm making this choice going off was a very strong choice for me. And cannabis was a really, a really good um, tool to go alongside that. 
Okay. <clears throat> and uh, if you could, um, knowing what you know now about these places, is it your belief that they should like uh, should or even could be fully regulated now, or is it your belief that they they should all just be shut down? Because I, yeah, I feel my like there is sort of a need for something, but. So here's here's my here's my uh, view, and this this comes out of working ten years in watching regulation be you know created. Um, regulation isn't going to solve the problems. Regulation yeah. is going to create structures that things can be carried out. Good regulations with funding for enforcement is great. Good regulations, funding for enforcement with public support and showing things, that's where you get your closures done. Um, and, and that is, I think, the yes, these programs have to close. And yeah. at the same time, we can't ignore that it's hard to be a teenager in this world. Yeah. Oh, holy cow, I couldn't imagine being a teenager now. And oh, yeah. so oh, yeah. where is that balance? How do we address the need that, like for myself, I I would not have done well in the home over yeah. those years. Um, and so what what does that look like? And in California, um, we actually know state money. Um, they don't send any money outside the state. Any placements are done in state now. Um, that was after Cornelius Fred Fredericks, I think Fred is it? Yeah. yeah, after Cornelius um, passed and the programs in California have really strict oversight too. Um, some of the more stricter now, are they perfect? No. Do I know people who work in some of the residential homes here in California? Yes. Are they good people who have been background checked and fingerprinted and everything? Yes. So those kind of things that we don't see without regulation has implications. Um, and I also think that when you have an industry or a something that has regulations and you don't, that has strength in, in public opinion. Yeah. And that is where, like for us, for Cedar Ridge is regulations didn't close them down, but the, we, that was a threat there. That was definitely one thing we, we threatened them with was how we were going to handle their licensing and how we would blow that up. So I think it's twofold and creating resources for kids um where they are is critical okay yeah well is there anything else you want people to know about your experience or anything you might tell a parent thinking about sending their kid to a place like this don't talk to an educational consultant um they are they're they're a, more of the thing of the past now they were very uh popular in my era but um it basically is like the MLM of the TTI and like making money and referrals. Um, someone who's so eager to help and find your placements is getting a kickback somewhere. Um, and that is where my parents really fell into a trap and felt like they were trusted and making the right decisions. So um, adults are manipulated. Adults are manipulated, and until they recognize that that's part of their role in it, is not um, not seeing through that, we're going to continue to have some of these placement problems. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, and if you ever want to come on for part two for follow-up, just let me know. And yeah. thank you guys uh, so much for watching so far on the video. If you watched so far, please uh, like the video, share it, and make sure you subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next week. See okay. you guys next time. These wings smell like a cantaloupe I can't even joke Mine on a billy on my haters They can joke Take the green pill Cause I'm always puffing out Find me in the streets of West Seattle Yeah, I'm proud Used to really do them things Used to really be about it Till I had to lay my homie down In the casket That shit was so tragic Had to bounce back like it's magic Yeah, my life been hella hectic Don't you forget it Better give me credit If I said it, I meant it Get them overtime credits It can only be expected